Okay, chapter 16, Analyzing Existing Data. <coughs> oh, better put up the... In this podcast, it's over chapter 16 from Ruben and Babby's Research Methods for Social Workers. We'll be <coughs> providing an overview of analyzing existing data. What is secondary data analysis, content, um, uh, <clears throat> analysis, historical, and comparative analysis. Uh, each of these methods allow the researchers to study a phenomenon both on a budget and without causing any further intrusion. What is existing data? Uh, includes statistical data, memorandums from agencies, all kinds of notes of legal documents. Um, uh, there's a growing body of data, uh, most of which is becoming much more easily available to social researchers. This data includes, you know, statistical data such as um, uh, birth rates and that sort of thing. Um, uh, Employment rates could be another example. Agency information could be uh, archived memorandums or uh, agency newsletters, those sorts of things, any kind of legal documents. In fact, government agencies and large uh, corporations are uh, archiving most of the data that flows through their organizations on a daily basis. And since the bulk of day to day business is conducted by the internet or in some cases intranet uh, there is an ongoing archive of information about both government and business activities including not-for-profits a great example of the use of existing data to create new information came during the Enron scandal Enron, for those of you who do not recall, was a large corporation that was engaged in the energy production industry. At some point, Enron had misrepresented its fiscal well-being to, to its shareholders, and some, some of the top executives did a massive sell-off of stocks <clears throat> just before the corporation imploded. <laughs> uh, but just because they were corporate officials at Enron and they were greedy and corrupt, did not, not mean they were completely stupid. Well, they were stupid. Uh, but back to the point. They went great. They went to great lengths to scrub the corporation of incriminating evidence of their wrongdoing. They almost got away with their wrongdoing. However, highly trained and competent investigative researchers took all of their email records and analyzed them for patterns. What was discovered was a pattern of rapid exchanges of electronic messages emails or instant messages, followed by a long period of no exchanges. When they looked closer at those messages, they would usually find a message with a short subject line like, meet me, exclamation mark, <laughs> or let's do lunch now, exclamation mark. Um, and this came after a period of time of talking about something that could potentially be incriminating. This enabled them to find this incriminating evidence in the emails and allow them to know what individuals were talking about um, prior to these urgent lunch, lunches. Um, and then the Justice Department could issue subpoenas and, uh, and one person would rat out the other for immunity. It was, it was wonderful. <laughs> this enabled the Justice Department to sift through literally tens of millions of emails in a relatively short amount of time. So, a combination of qualitative and quantitative research methods on the existing data brought the executives at Enron to justice. So, there's a use for research and evaluation. <clears throat> Secondary data analysis is a form of research which uses data that has already been collected and sometimes processed in a previous study and then is reanalyzed in a new study, often for a different purpose. That is not always the case. Sometimes the reanalysis is done in order to resolve doubts about the outcome, perhaps using a new or a different statistical test. 
or in the case of qualitative methods, having a new set of eyes to do the coding. Sometimes it is used to analyze a new research question that can be easily answered using uh, existing data. Also sometimes it is used to analyze the unanalyzed portions of data sets. And there's a lot of unanalyzed data out there. <clears throat> Here's something that I, I call a second primary analysis instead of a secondary analysis. It was existing data that, let me get my little pin going here, that I got from, well, it's, a, it's the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. It's also the National Household Survey on Drug Abuse. And it just changed its name in the, in the, in the early 90s. Uh, it was paid for by the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration. It's administered by the Research Technology Initiative or something like RTI. It's a big name. I just, I just know it by its initials. And it's held at the um, Intercollegiate Inter-University Consortium for uh, Social and um, Psychological, Social and Political Research, uh, which is at University of Michigan. So uh, all the data that I used for this analysis was uh, freely available. Um, the um, box over here is the comparing American Indians on the left to non-American Indians on the right uh, before American Indian Religious Freedom Act, after the American Indian Religious Freedom Act, around the mean use of the age of peyote. So, uh, um, <clears throat> I was able to calculate this because there are numbers of years of this. It goes back to the late 70s and then starting in the 80, 80 starting in 90, there was a, an, annual, an annual survey. So I had numbers of years of surveys of data rates, which you see over here in these two, these two charts on the right. These two charts on the right are actually uh, the same chart, one, one was created in R, the other was created in Excel. Uh, this one, more publication quality. This one is better for uh, a poster or something like that. Um, and what, what, what we can see, uh, uh, probably not clearly in this small size, is that American Indians had this kind of static rate of peyote use until the passage of the American Indian Religious Freedom Act. Then it shot up, bounced back down, shot back up and then kind of leveled off at some point. And you know, we can see that their trend line is basically one of up, when it, but in fact it's, it's level at this point. Um, so uh, it was, it was uh, an important analysis, I believe, to, to see if there was an effect, and apparently there was, but it, also the effect was so dramatic it, it brought up a lot of questions about the, the uh, the accuracy of survey instruments um, uh, and probably the social desirability bias um, and uh, some amount of fear, I would say. Anyway, also in that, that data was um, uh, information from the Texas Department of Public Safety on peyote harvests. All of it was free. Uh, the use of secondary data analysis began to expand in the 1960s, and this coincides rather nicely with the time in which large data collections were, were just beginning to be maintained by universities uh, and government organizations uh, for use with the uh, emerging supercomputer age. Because of these computers, it, because of these computers, it was found 
convenient and practical to collect and preserve large amounts of data in electronic form. Although at the outset, these computers sometimes, that elect, quote unquote, electronic data form was actually punch cards that uh, was coded uh, because of the way they were punched. Now, I mentioned the Inter-University um, Consortium for Social and Political Research at Michigan earlier. Well, there's a lot of those kind of sites, which some which, um, which ha are just individual studies. Um, you go to any of the national institutes, you'll find lots of links to uh, find data. Uh, but then there's these ones like the, the NAE Casey organization that's got um, the Kids Count link, you know, all kinds of information about children. The uh, Cornell's got some more about uh, ch uh, child abuse. Uh, <clears throat> and then, uh, oh, what's this one? This is an education related one, the one at the bottom. So. And there are literally dozens of these websites I've visited over the last few years. Uh, most are freely available, um, but some require uh, 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 either individual or institutional subscriptions. And you know, here at UMKC, we are we are subs subscribers to some of these organizations. And uh, and usually, your status as a graduate student, you have status, folks. Uh, remember that. Um, can get you access to some of this, this data. So um, sometimes you have to fill out a form and request it. And uh, uh, and if you happen to run in that into a situation like that, uh, be cognizant of, of you know that it may take a little bit of time to get permission. So there's there's all kinds of data that exist in in public records. Uh, um, you know, the statistical abstract of the United States has, has been published probably since the 1700s. Uh, the, um, you know, federal agencies all, all have, all have, as I mentioned, usually some link to some kind of a data. Uh, the Obama administration has been very kind of uh, prominent in this area of getting public data out to the public. Um, um, you know, if, if you're, if you're at all interested in doing any kind of uh, international research or comparisons, international comparisons. Um, you know, an ideal source of information uh, internationally, surprisingly, is the Central Intelligence in, in Central Intelligence Agency. Now, while you may think of the CIA as as the spy agency, uh, its primary job, and it does a huge amount of it, is gathering information about other countries, primarily economic and and social behavioral. Uh, you know, to, to, to meet their, their mission of predicting uh, safety and security of the world, uh, you know, tracking economic and social trends is much more important than, than um, um, uh, tracking, um, you know, nuclear pro proliferation, although that's, that's, is very important. Um, uh, Of course, as we, we, we saw from the slides earlier, the charts are produced on peyote use would, would have, <clears throat> the charts that I produced on peyote use would have cost me millions of dollars probably to obtain independently. And I'm not exaggerating here. I'm sure it would have cost millions of dollars. I'm sure, I'm sure the government has spent millions of dollars to track all that data. Um, so that's wonderful. Uh, the biggest advantage of, of this existing data is that it's, it's sometimes it's very, very cheap and you know it's basically uh, leg work or finger work now, uh, uh, and and it's quick. You can usually get advantage of your data right away, and and, and uh, plus you get the, the benefit from from uh, uh, the work of other uh, researchers. Uh, uh, and this can be especially helpful when when you have uh, when you're getting data that come from a a large budgeted research team, and so they're able to develop and test survey instruments uh, to assure their validity. Uh, uh, also, th these large government surveys are often able to conduct the kind of 
stratified random sample that could lead to a very good representation of the entire population. When large projects collect data over time, it becomes possible then to monitor trends, or in the case of my research, was able to discern the effect of the federal legislation uh, regarding peyote use on the actual use. Now, of course, the primary disadvantage, naturally, is that by its very nature, all secondary data is old, although some of it isn't that old. As <clears throat> you, as the researcher, have no control over um, uh, how the research was designed, uh, what kinds of questions were asked, and in what context the, the questioning was done. Um, um, sometimes you, you know very little about the data other than the data. Another big problem and, the, and an important one for researchers is what it was done with missing data. Uh, fortunately, many large government-sponsored surveys will explain what they did with their missing data. Problems of reliability or validity, in my opinion, are often offset by these very large databases problems because of the missing data. <clears throat> Other problems when using secondary data or using somebody else's data is that quite often documentation is a problem. Uh, sometimes it's hard to discern the true purpose for which the data was gathered. Other times, large data sets which have not been processed and converted to an electronic form are difficult to transform into a usable data set. Um, yeah. And even the early electronic data sets, which were created before certain standards for long-term storage, some of those are hard to convert to a usable form. Content analysis. <clears throat> now, content analysis is a method of transforming qualitative material into some sort of usable quantitative material. Uh, content analysis is used quite often in communication studies, but it is easily adaptable for social work pur purposes. Researchers who are concerned that, for example, tape, television or radio shows, uh, which present themselves as being neutral, are in fact biased. Uh, what they can do is obtain archives of those radio shows or television programs, random, randomly select an adequate number, then have teams of coders listen to those selected programs and count the times they perceive the comment commentator as being biased. These can then be quantitatively analyzed using available statistical means. And this is done, you know, not infrequently, you know, around bias, around use of, of, uh, of uh, uh, racial and gender uh, uh, slurs or racial and gender um, stereotyping. Uh, so uh, it's a good way that you know we can keep a track on uh, on what these you know these social uh, media are doing. Uh, now, as you can see from this slide, the conceptual ways of content analysis is really no different from from any other kind of research. You have to determine your sampling frame, you know what to observe for how long, how often. Um, um, uh, and where are you going to get this data? And it can occur in many different forms at many different levels. Um, uh, it can be words, it can be context, it can be books. Um, for example, a couple of years ago I had a student in this very research program uh, uh, who was very interested in children's therapy. He did a content analysis of a children's book, which was com was commonly used in children's therapy. Not a book about children's therapy, but a book that therapists would use. You know, they'd read it to the child and ask the child what they thought of different things. And uh, uh, So what he did was analyze the relationship uh, between the placement of certain themes and certain animals and their genders. Uh, while he did not discover a bias around gender, if I remember correctly, he did discover that certain biases were being made about different animals. Uh, he accomplished this by carefully constructed coding scheme, and when the framework was developed, he simply had to go through 
and read the book with his memo book in hand. And it was a really nice study. The advantage of using other types of analysis over other types of analysis is that content analysis allows the researcher to use qualitative means and go deeply into the subject matter. While there are types of content analysis which simply counts the manifest content or the surface uh, uh, or easily discerned content, for example, the number of times he versus she is used or the presence of sexist or racist terms, uh, and you know those can be enumerated by defining which terms you're looking for and then counting them. It's relatively simple. If you have your material in electronic form, there are statistical programs that can uh, do this kind of counting for you. The R statistical program has such capability, but you need to be a halfway decent programmer in order to accomplish that. <clears throat> More important than manifest content is the ability to look at the underlying meaning or the latent content. Uh, an article that I'm currently working on for a chapter in a book is a form of content analysis. I look at the archives of the Conference on Charities and Corrections from 1877 through the 19, 1960s for references to the term Indian. And instead, rather than just counting how many there were, and there weren't very many, I was able to look at the context in which they were delivered and discern some deeper meaning. So much like we do in, in other types of research, we see that in content analysis requires us to oper operationally define terms that are mutually exclusive or you know, terms that are exhaustive. Remember those terms from, from a couple chapters back? Uh, going back to my reference to the Conference on Charities and Corrections research, I also use the term Native American, American Indian, in addition to the term Indian for my search. These were the common terms used during that time period. I discovered that there were also incidents of tribal names mentioned uh, near the term Indian. However, to search for the names of the various hundreds of American Indian tribes was considered kind of beyond the scope of the research. Uh, so there was a lot of reasons why I, I didn't do that. <clears throat> Much can be learned from Ruben and Babby's discussion about on the nuts and bolts of content analysis, record keeping that can be applied to other types of observational research. Once it is well defined what you are looking for, and you can't, and you can recognize it when you see it, then you develop some kind of mechanism by which you count them. If you have your content in electronic form, the use of extensible markup language is a valuable tool. There are also software programs in which you can do qualitative analysis like this. I will discuss that kind of software later on in the semester and again in the following uh, semester. You know, like any other type of, 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 um, of uh, uh, like all other types of secondary data analysis or existing data analysis, uh, content analysis can be conducted you know, quickly for low cost. It also has a luxury that you can go back and correct mistakes, which is really a, a luxury of, of any secondary uh, data analysis or any analysis of existing data. Uh, for example, if you have one coder who consistently rates the newscast as more sexist than the other coder, you can go back and review each of those coding incidents. Also, as was the case in my content analysis, I was able to traverse over a century of time quite easily. Content analysis are limited to some kind of communication that has been previously recorded, however. Um, so they're you know, in books, uh, magazines, newspaper articles, professional journals, radio, television archives, and as the executive of Enron found out, email communications. <clears throat> historical comparative analysis. Social workers also engage in research using existing data that mirrors the type of research done in other disciplines, particularly by historians. Sometimes it is useful to compare historical figures in a profession like social work to the, the profession's current manifestation. The 
techniques used in historical analysis is kind of moving backwards. It's moving from the current, what is already thought to be historically accurate, and then moving back until you get back to the raw data, uh, such as diary, lectures, original documents, some of those sort of things. Uh, and this is a process of, of corroborating, you know, the current belief with with the belief at different points in time. Um, and, uh, um, uh, and, and it's important when doing this to to understand that each of the each of the historians of a person or of a phenomenon uh, do their historical research in a different uh, context based on whatever was going on in, in the time that they were doing it, the, the zeitgeist, as they say. Finally, um, um, You know, um, historical research requires the ability that we get into the mental point of view of the population uh, that you are re researching. It's, it's pretty common for people to overlay their contemporary values and worldview with that of the population that they are studying. Uh, much of historical analysis seems like something of an art, and it's, which is acquired through practice and mentorship uh, under the tutelage of a accomplished researcher of history, um, <clears throat> but um, where's my there we go. Um, the art of hermeneutics, hermeneutics, or sometimes called uh, when one reaches that point of verstehen, it's a couple of research terms that are actually from German, but uh, uh, to understand uh, what is what, what was going on. Um, uh, one way to help in this understanding is, is by adopting some kind of a historical, uh, a theoretical paradigm for your historical research. Going back to my, my uh, uh, book chapter on the Conference of Charities and Correction about American Indians, uh, in order to give me a lens to look at the research with, I, I adopted a uh, standpoint view. Um, uh, purposely adopting the view of, of, of an indigenous person at that time. So uh, it helped me to look at kind of what was going on in the times that helped, helped to understand uh, kind of why people were doing what they were doing. So that's my three podcasts. I'm wrapping up. So enjoy. Uh, I will see you all in the discussion boards or in office hours online.